Hi, everyone, and welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life Program Climate Series. My name is Tracy Bowman, and I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Relations and a very proud UM alum. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So thank you to all of you for joining us wherever you are around the world and making this event part of your day. We're able to offer this program free to all of our alumni and friends, thanks to the very generous sponsorship of our affinity partner, IA Financial Group. Many thanks to them. You can learn more about the insurance options that they offer you alumni on our alumni website. So before I introduce today's speaker and topic, just a few housekeeping details. So if you are a repeat uh, attendee at this program, you will know all of these details, but I'm going to share it anyways. Uh, there will be time at the end for questions for our speaker. So what we use two different ways for you to do that. We use a platform called Slido, that's www.slido.com. And today's password is VLFL13. And you just enter that in uh, in your browser and you're able to uh, to ask a question that way. I monitor it and uh, we'll make those questions available to our presenter. Alternatively, if you don't want to use Slido, you can just ask your questions right in the YouTube chat. And we will also monitor that as well. So you've got two ways of asking questions. I highly encourage you to take advantage of that. We have a Canada Research Chair today presenting. So uh, it's, it's a really exciting uh, presentation for you to be part of. So I, I encourage you ask away uh, on anything that comes to mind. Uh, as you also know, we're recording today's session, so this will be on our YouTube channel afterwards. So if you haven't, if you're not able to participate live or your friends aren't, you can share this with them so they can watch it later, as well as you can watch it again and again. Again, if you're a repeat participant, you'll know that we have 30 plus wonderful sessions from our UM alumni, uh, UM researchers and professors on every topic imaginable. So please do take advantage of watching those sessions. So with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. We have Dr. Nicole Wilson, and her topic is climate justice and water governance in the Canadian Arctic. So as I mentioned a little earlier, Dr. Wilson is a Canada Research Chair. It's a very prestigious role, uh, and, and she's a Canada Research Chair in Arctic Environmental Change and Governance. She is also a professor in the, in the Centre for Earth Observation Science, and Department of Environment and Geography. Her research focuses on Indigenous peoples, environmental governance, and environmental change, and examines the many ways Indigenous peoples are asserting their self-determination and revitalizing their governance systems to respond to various stressors, including climate change and resource development. She's very passionate about water governance, politics, and security. She's worked in partnership with Yukon First Nations to examine the implications of the water rights acknowledged in their modern land claim agreements for water governance and decision making in the territory. And much of her research program does focus on the Arctic, although she's also working to build research collaborations and projects here in Manitoba. Strong partnerships with Indigenous governments and organizations are really central to her community-based research approach. She also uh, holds a Shirk Insight Development Grant, where she's conducting a pan-Arctic survey to examine the connections between Indigenous-led community-based monitoring and environmental governance and decision-making. Decision so with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Dr. Wilson. Thanks so much for that uh, introduction and thanks for everybody for coming out to listen to my presentation today. Um, I just wanted to add to that territorial acknowledgement um, that I am a scholar of settler origin. I was born in Treaty 7 territory in Calgary, Alberta, and I moved to Winnipeg in July of 2020. Today um, I'm located on Treaty 1 territory and I wanted to acknowledge that um, here in Winnipeg our drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation and our electricity comes from Treaty 5 territory. Uh, today, I'm going to be um, sharing some work um, looking at the implications of climate justice for water governance in the Arctic. 
this presentation builds on uh, research that I've conducted um, in Yukon, Canada, in partnership with Kluwani, White River, Carcross, Tagish, and Trondek Wichin First Nations. Just wanted to provide a brief overview of my talk. Um, I'll be um, giving a bit of an introduction into Arctic freshwater systems, as well as to um, you know, defining water governance and, and um, the implications of climate change for that. I'll move into an in-depth case study from Yukon, Canada. And then we'll zoom back out again to look at some of the implications uh, for Arctic water governance, as well as some future research directions that I'm hoping to explore. Um, so we often when we think about the Arctic, um, people think about uh, marine systems. Uh, that's where a lot of the research has been conducted. Um, but freshwater systems are, are also very important. And so when we're talking about Arctic freshwater systems, we're referring to the hydrological regime that includes shelf and coastal regions, freshwater recirculated back into the Arctic Ocean, and terrestrial drainage systems that extend beyond the Arctic. In this cold climate system, the cryosphere represents a significant um, aspect um, of the, the hydrology. And the cryosphere is just uh, everything frozen. So permafrost glaciers, lake and river ice, um, as well as sea ice. Um, this diagram just depicts some of the interactions between the hydrosphere and the cryosphere. Um, and you'll notice that it very much uh, just shows ma the material kind of relationships of water as it cycles through these processes. I'm actually a social scientist. And so um, while of course it's important to understand these processes, um, I'm interested in the complex relationships between these material dimensions of water as well as the sociocultural and political relationships um, that also intersect. So today I'm going to be talking to you about one of my favorite topics, water governance. Um, so while there's much to say about the impacts of, of climate change, um, as I was mentioning on the physical and biological processes within Arctic freshwater systems, um, Arctic uh, water governance also deserves attention. And when I'm talking about water governance, I'm talking about um, something, it's broadly defined as a set of regulatory processes, mechanisms and institutions through which political actors influence water related decisions, actions and outcomes. And so when we think about decision makings about water uh, policy and gov governance, we often just think about governments. So the term governance is a conscious sh um, consciously tries to shift away from just focusing on uh, state governments or, or governments to um, look at the roles of new actors and institutions and how they're reshaping decision making processes about water. And we can see a lot of this occurring in the Arctic. Um, so again, well, when we're talking about governance, often people think about uh, states. Um, and so here you can see a map of the Arctic um, from the perspective of, of Arctic jurisdictions. And you can see um, when you compare with the previous map, um, the various kind of uh, watersheds are, are intersected by, by state boundaries. Um, there are also um, many other important actors in governance in the Arctic and um, indigenous peoples are are um, very are very important and um, have uh, significant roles in all aspects of Arctic governance. So, um, of the approximately four million people who inhabit the Arctic, about ten percent are indigenous. Um, this proportion varies greatly across Arctic regions. So, for instance, uh, while the Inuit uh, comprise eighty five percent of the population of Nunavut, um, indigenous peoples make up uh, twenty three percent of the population of Yukon. Um, in terms of freshwater governance and indigenous peoples and their relationships to water um, are disproportionately affected by climate change. Um, and so um, I'll be centering a lot of my discussion on that um, and, and indigenous peoples roles in water governance. Um, so a lot of my research has um, related to um, the topic of indigenous water governance. Um, there's many other um, scholars kind of working in this field um, who advance conceptualization and practice on this, including um, uh, Métis Anishinaabe scholar, M.A. Kraft, um, Cree scholar, Michelle Daigle, Anishinaabe scholar, um, Devon McGregor, and others. So when we're talking about indigenous water governance, um, we're talking about indigenous peoples um, relationships to water and modes of decision-making about water. 
Um, these, these are both informed by historical and ongoing exclusion from colonial water governance frameworks. Um, but rooted in the assumption that um, Indigenous peoples have inherent rights, authorities, and responsibilities to water as a living entity. So when we're talking about um, climate change, um, we need to think about um, how, how climate, changes, um, climate change impacts on fresh water are affecting uh, the water governance system. And in, in particular, I'm interested in how it's affecting um, Indigenous water governance systems. So um, as I mentioned, I'm a social scientist, so I won't be going into detail on, on the, you know, the impacts of climate change on the hydrosphere or in the Arctic hydrosphere, but I can tell you about a few of the impacts. And if you wanna read more, you can look up these two um, very good reports. Um, so we know that the Arctic is changing at a startling pace with global warming, raising temperatures in the region um, at roughly two to three times the rate of the global average. Um, this warming trend is uh, driving changes in freshwater and in particular in, in the cryosphere. So we're seeing permafrost thaw, glacial recession, for example, and these have cascading impacts on freshwater systems, including water quality, quantity, and flows. Um, while liquid water and water vapor might not seem, um, might seem irrelevant in a region where there, so much water is frozen, water in all forms play key roles in Arctic processes and in ocean systems. So for example, um, the increase in freshwater flow to the ocean from rivers and melting glaciers has implications for ocean circulation and climate that extend far beyond the Arctic. But um, today I'll be focusing a bit more on um, thinking about um, climate change impacts on freshwater systems within the Arctic. And so understanding um, the roles of these changes um, is, is really important for understanding um, how they will affect the lives of Arctic uh, peoples and e ecosystems. So a lot of people have thought about um, the relationship between climate change and water governance. Um, and um, one of the key things is that, um, that people talk about is something called a, a loss of stationarity. And so a lot of water governance um, is premised on the fact that we, we could make, um, we can make decisions based on historic trends, but um, when we lose this stationarity, um, we see an inability to predict the future events based on these historic trends. Um, and so there's a greater uncertainty um, in the system. And so when, when thinking about this, um, people have uh, proposed this idea about building water resilience. And so we see scholars like Julia Baird and Lucy Rodina talk about this. And Lucy Rodina defines water resilience as um, to be generally understood as the ability of water systems, including their technological, ecological, and social dimensions to withstand a variety of water related risks, as well as the ability of such systems to adapt or transform to new hydrologic regimes. Similarly, other scholars and, and relatedly um, talk about the need to develop adaptive water governance systems um, in order to improve the capacity of the systems to respond to change and uncertainty. So um, within this scholarship, uh, we have, uh, have had people kind of looking at some of the characteristics of systems that are um, more adaptive to change. And these can include um, polycentricity, uh, which is the idea that um, you know, political authority is dispersed throughout the system, uh, participatory governance, new actors uh, or new actors and institutions are, are participating in governance. So people talk about this in terms of the public or perhaps indigenous peoples. Um, social learning, uh, where um, we um, take in new information um, across uh, various timescales uh, in ways that contribute to um, incremental and transformative change in the system. So we're kind of learning by doing, learning as we go. Uh, and then finally, a bioregional approach. Um, so um, this would address um, the frequent mismatch between hydrologic and institutional scales. So you remember the um, images that I showed you of um, watersheds in the Arctic and then um, state systems. And that's, that's um, with the state borders there, that's a mismatch between hydrologic and institutional scales. So to address this, a bioregional approach might be watershed governance. Um, at the same time, um, a critique of some of this literature is that um, some of the, um, you know, relationships between people and various kind of uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, 
uh, understandings of water as well as um, political inequalities within the system are not uh, well um, thought through. And so um, in today's talk, I propose to um, add kind of a climate justice lens to thinking about um, water governance in the context of climate change. And so um, climate justice is a concept that addresses the just division, fair sharing and equitable distribution of the benefits and burdens of climate change and responsibilities to deal with climate change. So um, Farhana Sultana, who's a critical interdisciplinary scholar, looks at climate justice and um, she states that it's about paying attention to how climate change impacts uh, different people differently and disproportionately. And it's about finding ways to address these injustices in fair and, inequi and equitable ways. Adding to this, um, there are um, a number of uh, a growing number of scholars looking at climate um, justice for Indigenous peoples in a field called uh, Indigenous climate justice. And um, this uh, particularly pays attention to the disproportionate impacts of climate change on Indigenous peoples, as well as the um, notion that um, they have to a limited extent contributed to the root causes of climate change. Um, uh, one particular thinker in this field is Kyle White, who's a Potawatomi scholar, um, who notes that colonialism and capitalism are inextricably tied together and have led to the groundwork for the carbon intensive economics, which uh, are driving climate change. And so that's just a way of saying that, um, that um, we need to look at the root causes of climate change and, and colonialism is part of that. So in today's talk, I ask, you know, what can a climate justice perspective add to our understanding of resilient water governance in the Arctic? Um, and as I mentioned, I'm going to be kind of zooming in on a case study um, in Yukon, Canada. And I wanted to just start with a little bit of background on um, water governance in Canada. Um, and so um, very uh, important to kind of Arctic water governance are these modern land claim agreements. Um, so this is a map um, of modern land claim agreements, also known as comprehensive land claim agreements. You'll see most of them in Canada are in the Canadian North. Um, each of these are all are, are accompanied by self-government agreements, sometimes contained within the agreements or stand alone with them. But since 1973, uh, 24 comprehensive land claim agreements covering about 40% of Canada's land mass have been ratified and brought into effect. 18 of them include um, self-government provisions. Um, and so um, most of these agreements contain um, uh, acknowledgements of Indigenous water rights uh, and sometimes whole chapters. Um, and this is within the context of um, water governance in Canada, um, where the Canadian um, constitution um, does, um, doesn't acknowledge Indigenous water rights. So um, in Canada, uh, the constitution divides authority for uh, water. Um, actually, water is not even explicitly mentioned in the constitution, I, I should say, but um, the constitutional division of powers for water uh, between the federal and provincial government um, the federal government um, has authority for fisheries, navigation, federal lands and Indian reserves and international relations, whereas provincial uh, and territorial governments um, have uh, authority for water supply, pollution control, hydroelectric development, flow regulation and authorization of water use. Um, and then provincial territorial governments delegate some authorities to um, local or municipal governments. Um, Indigenous governments do have authority for water governance in spite of these arrangements based on their own Indigenous law and also um, importantly um, have uh, rights acknowledged in the Constitution under uh, Section 35 which have implications for water governance. So that's just a little bit of, of background um, to help talk about you know, why these modern land claim agreements are also so important in that they're some of the most um, explicit acknowledgements of Indigenous uh, water rights uh, in Canada. So uh, in Yukon, where I've been working for about the last decade, um, there are uh, 14 Yukon First Nations and 11 of them having uh, concluded um, land claim agreements, also known as final agreements. So um, through these modern treaties, um, First Nations have retained title to about 10% of their land, also known as settlement lands, in exchange for shared decision making in the remaining um, 90%. And uh, the purpose of these um, treaties was um, not only to create certainty, but um, also to 
um, foster reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. And in Yukon, they are accompanied by standalone self-government agreements, um, which um, there's a lot to say about those agreements, but importantly, it means that the First Nations are no longer under the Indian Act um, and have much expanded powers for self-government, including the um, what are referred to as province-like powers to make their own legislation. Now, um, chapter 14 is the chapter I've spent kind of the most time looking at in these agreements. Um, and it's all about water and water management. So it includes the acknowledgement of various water rights, including a very strong language on the right to unaltered water quality, quantity and rate of flow, including seasonal flows on or adjacent to settlement lands. It also acknowledges uh, the right to traditional uses of water and saw the creation of co-management boards um, uh, with several with um, kind of authorities uh, related to water. And so co-management boards um, in Yukon are made up of uh, one third of appointees are First Nations, one third are um, from Yukon government and the other from the federal government or appointed from those governments, I should say. Um, and the the one most obviously about water is called the Yukon Water Board. It actually predates land claim agreements, um, but was made into a co-management board through land claims. Um, also important to this water governance context, um, you know, although there are many pieces of uh, federal legislation at, at play, um, probably the most important given the constitutional division of power is the Yukon Waters Act, um, which kind of defines things related to, for example, water licensing. Um, and so um, I'm going to be uh, sharing some, some research from um, some, some uh, findings from some research that I've done on these modern land claim agreements and starting to think about um, what this tells us um, about um, climate change and water governance, um, in particular with this climate justice lens. Um, so I've been doing community-based research um, in Yukon since about 2012. Um, actually, before I started my PhD, I was involved in a grant-funded project and partnered with four Yukon First Nations, including Kluwani, Trondek Wichin, White River, and Carcross Tagish First Nation. Um, all of um, whom agreed to partner with me for my PhD research. Um, and then actually I continued on after my PhD into a, a postdoc working with Carcross Tagish First Nation. Um, and I continue to work uh, in Yukon today. Um, my research is community-based because uh, it is, um, it, you know, fundamentally based on the questions and interests of my community partners as well. It follows their traditional knowledge policies. So these policies are really important and they set the standard for how First Nations want to engage with external partners. Um, for example, including um, being involved in all phases of research, um, having uh, and, and having all of the kind of raw, what would be called data returned, including all, um, all interviews and, and audio and things like that. So they can have it in their archive. Um, so, Based on this research, um, uh, this question, uh, what is water has, you know, come up a lot. And I, you know, I returned to this diagram that I shared before on the kind of biophysical um, processes um, and the key uh, related to the key interactions between the cryosphere and the hydrosphere. And as I noted, these are um, depictions of material kind of relationships between water in its various forms in the Arctic. Um, but when we think about water, water is actually much more than just these material relationships. Um, the people that I interviewed um, talked about water in so many ways um, that that's much more than a, a resource that can be owned and managed, how we often think about it. But uh, water is a living entity, a relative, a healer, often considered medicine, a teacher, to be respected, um, and, and much more. Um, these are just these are just some examples that people shared with me, uh, which can be illustrated by this quote um, by one elder from CTFN First Nation, um, who stated, um, "For me, water has a life. It's living. It has great power, and it's now teaching us. We're learning more, a, a little bit, like a drip at a time, if you like, about that potential power that water has to change things. So there's a great power in water when we stop and take a look at it, like a living being instead of just a for-profit resource. You know." And so with that as kind of background, I wanted to move a little bit more into talking about climate change and climate impacts on water. Uh, indigenous peoples have complex knowledge systems and ha are, have been observing all kinds of changes in water. Um, one of the kind of uh, 
really um, obvious kind of events that ha happened uh, during my time that I've been spending in Yukon was um, in 2017, a, a river called Slims River actually stopped flowing. Um, it, it's a tributary of Kluwani Lake. And um, this news article here uh, talks about it as a river piracy. And essentially what happened is that the glacier that was its source receded to the extent that it started flowing in the other direction. So one system captured the water of another system. And these kinds of events have really, you know, important uh, implications for Indigenous peoples who have, um, you know, rely, for example, on, on Kluwani Lake um, and various other um, factors that are affecting the water levels in the lake um, and has cascading impacts for, say, fish spawning habitat, etc. Um, another example um, raised by an elder from CTFN also stated that, um, well, the ice usually freezes up. Uh, when I was young in November is when the lake uh, freezes up. Now it's freezing up in the end of December and January. So uh, there's that change. And then I guess you have to watch it when you are going on the lake because the ice doesn't seem to be as solid as it was before. And that's why they have a lot of problems with people falling through the ice. And so what they're talking about is the impacts of warming temperatures on lake ice. Um, and so um, it's freezing later and also it's um, um, thinner or uh, you know, as more unpredictable than it used to be. And this has, you know, super important uh, implications for, you know, people's ability to harvest fish, um, to you spend time um, in camps where a lot of intergenerational knowledge uh, transmission takes place. So I think it was in uh, March 2019, there was supposed to be a muskrat camp, which is normally held in the spring. And the ice was actually just too thin, it was going to be dangerous, so it had to be cancelled. So that was just a, a real lost opportunity um, for some youth to to learn how to um, to do that and to so spend time with some of their elders. <clears throat> so there's many more, uh, you know, ch changes occurring that I could talk about, um, but um, I wanted to uh, move along here to start thinking a little bit more about the implications of this for water governance. So first, I wanted to start with a couple of critiques of the system um, that very much come out of my PhD work, um, but that have important implications for thinking about adaptation to um, climate impacts on water. Um, so again, I mentioned chapter 14 on water management. Um, I, I could talk about this all day, as I mentioned, uh, but um, I'll just quickly summarize that people definitely said that they saw um, substantive and positive changes as a result of the agreements, and particularly this chapter and their ability to influence decisions about water. But also um, they found uh, that it, it didn't go far enough to acknowledge their water rights. And in particular, they talked about um, the continued assertion of crown jurisdiction over water uh, or the, this idea that um, the federal government and provincial territorial governments own water rather than First Nations. Um, and also this idea of uh, privileging settler or colonial worldviews and forms of governance. And, um, you know, if you think back to my question, what is water and the answers to it, if you understand uh, water as your relative, then, then this statement, um, which both conveys this crown jurisdiction that water belongs to government, um, if you think about the statement, um, then um, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's um, uh, problematic <laughs> if you think water is a living entity and, and perhaps a relative. Um, so layering on top of that, we begin to think about uh, climate justice and water governance. So um, there's a lot of things happening in Canada related to um, water governance that have implications for the North. Um, for example, uh, the mandate letter uh, for 2019 and the supplementary mandate letter for 2021 directed the Minister of Environment and Climate Change to uh, work with other ministers and parties to create a Canada Water Agency. The new agency is um, still um, under development, but it will work with provinces, territories, Indigenous peoples, etc., um, to manage water in Canada. Um, and for example, um, the uh, what we heard document, which has been part of the stakeholder and public engagement, notes that um, adapting to climate change is a key part of this mission. Um, at the territorial level, um, this is uh, just a screen cap from the uh, uh, water strategy that is actually um, finalized now. Uh, it finished in 2019 and hasn't been renewed, but I still use this example to show um, that people, that um, the Yukon government is thinking about climate impacts uh, on decision-making about water, 
for example, um, through this mentioning of the principle of adaptability, the need to promote and develop adaptive management and strategies to cope with uncertainty and change. Um, federal climate policy, um, which is exemplified by the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, um, it doesn't really specifically talk about water, um, but this is essentially our uh, uh, Canada's commitment um, to implement the Paris Agreement, or uh, which noted um, the need to hold the increase in global average temperatures to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature to increase to 1.5 degrees and above uh, pre-industrial levels, recognizing that this would significantly reduce risk and impacts of climate change. So this climate mitigation approach um, would, would um, be beneficial <laughs> for uh, climate warming in the Arctic, obviously. Uh, there is also specific acknowledgements within this agreement related to indigenous rights um, and, and knowledge systems. Also at the territorial level, um, there's a climate strategy. It's a strategy for climate change, energy and green economy that talks about water in, in a number of ways, um, including um, the need to adapt existing surface water and groundwater monitoring um, to be able to better track long-term trends, uh, as well as developing flood probability maps, for example, for all Yukon communities, uh, many of which are First Nation communities. It also notes um, Indigenous-led um, efforts both for adaptation and mitigation and this is just one example that I drew from um, uh, from White River First Nation where they are switching from um, diesel powered uh, diesel power in the community to to a newly constructed uh, solar field I also wanted to draw on indigenous water strategies um, indigenous peoples across Canada are creating all kinds of um, plans and strategies to protect water and climate change is uh, a cross-cutting theme across all of them. It's a frequently noted stressor and you know, also included in many of the, the suggestions for how to um, respond um, to, to um, you know, how, how to um, respond to climate change. So um, these um, plans and strategies, um, many of them engage with both Indigenous and Western knowledge systems, but they're generally rooted in indigenous traditions and relationships to water. And one thing that's really struck me in my research is um, on the topic of, um, on the topic is the extent to which uh, my First Nations partners have really emphasized um, the need to revitalize indigenous traditions um, rather than simply creating plans um, in this way. Um, so plans or strategies, it's about revitalizing um, indigenous knowledge systems. One of the things that I've had a pleasure, the pleasure to be a part of is a water legislation project, as I mentioned, through self-government agreements. First Nations can actually, self-governing First Nations can create their own legislation. This is a very long-term project, but um, the idea has been to, to look at, you know, uh, what the possibility would be for Carcross Tagish First Nation to develop their own piece of water legislation. And fundamentally, um, this I, it is rooted in the idea of um, revitalizing and articulating Indigenous water laws or the Tagish, um, Tagish and Clinket water laws um, and relationships to water. So um, their governance system is already very much uh, rooted in Indigenous law um, and it's uh, developed based on a clan-based system. So uh, what we would often think of as a, a, the chief in council um, is uh, the Kasha the Hen, who's the chief, and then uh, a clan-based system with representation from all six of the clans who are represented in this photo by the clan pools there um, outside of the, the learning center. And all of the gov governance bodies, um, for example, the land management board that I work with a lot here are also clan-based. And so when we're thinking about water um, and what uh, Tagish and Clinket water law would be, um, I, I did an interview with an elder back in 2012 before I even really knew anything uh, about Indigenous water law. I was just new, new to working in the territory and, and um, as a settler, brand new to learning about um, these things. And this elder said to me, um, the laws that we have for water in the clan houses, those things, those uh, kind of things are important because we need to respect water. And just in those two, two sentences um, summed up so much of what I've been thinking about and learning about um, with this uh, nation for the last decade. Um, 
And essentially what that means is you need to go to each of the clan houses because they have um, knowledge about uh, water law and relationships to water that are distinct and you need to all, uh, work across all of them. Um, so uh, one of the things that we were doing is um, we had a workshop um, back, I guess, in November 2019 um, to bring together representatives of each of the six clans as well as some youth um, to begin to talk about this. And this diagram here just summarizes some of the um, knowledge that people shared. Um, and uh, and yeah, this is an, an ongoing project today and you don't just create legislation overnight. Um, but um, yeah, I learned, I learned a lot from this process. And I think um, this idea that uh, re these re revitalization processes, revitalizing Indigenous knowledge systems uh, and revitalizing Indigenous law that have very much been sidelined through colonial processes is fundamental to um, responding to climate change and fundamental to developing resilient water governance systems. So in the broader Arctic, um, just zooming back out again to this picture, um, this has uh, many implications. Um, and there are extremely diverse indigenous peoples across the Arctic, um, very diverse um, uh, hydrologic as well as cryospheric <laughs> um, characteristics um, and distinct um, ways of governing things uh, through, um, for example, even in Canada, various, um, various territorial governments have different approaches. Um, and so uh, I'm interested in, in thinking about that. and. Um, so uh, moving forward in terms of thinking about uh, some of the implications of what I was sharing about uh, Indigenous climate justice, I wanted to just say that um, some of the things I learned about this that are important for water governance is um, and uh, developing resilient uh, systems is about thinking about addressing root causes of climate change and climate impacts to water, um, including colonialism. And so thinking about the kind of systemic ways that colonialism might um, reduce people's ability to respond to climate change and the impacts on water. I also think that uh, non-Indigenous peoples and governments have a responsibility to live up to um, commitments to, to climate mitigation. So as I mentioned, um, our federal government uh, has, a, a federal, has a strategy and has signed on to the Paris Agreement. Um, but um, there, <laughs> there is a, a but here, um, as expressed by the commissioner, of the environment and sustainable development in both 27, uh, 2017 and 2021, just recently, um, Canada's record on climate change should be judged not only on the targets and, and commitments that Canada has made over the years, but also on its actions. So despite commitments from government after government significantly reduced greenhouse gas emissions over the past three decades, Canada has failed to translate these commitments into real reductions in net emissions. Um, so. Instead, Canada's emissions uh, continue to continue to rise, um, and so um, yeah, basically this idea that um, we need to think about how Arctic systems can become more adaptive, but also we need to think about um, how we can address the root causes of this so that um, people have less to respond to. This image is also from the same report. I recommend you actually go read that report. It was really informative, um, but it just shows how um, the various climate commitments that Canada has made over the years and backed by our, our rising uh, greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> In uh, you know relation to water governance, I think um, my research has really shown me that uh, we need to look at these jurisdictional injustices related to water and the ways that they limit Indigenous people's ability to respond to, to climate change. So if you don't actually have the ability to make decisions or very much ability to influence decision-making processes, then it's more difficult um, to, to respond to the impacts that you're uh, facing within your, your territories. Um, and so essentially we want to move um, more to the, <laughs> to the further side of this diagram uh, towards co-governance and Indigenous forms of governance. I think also uh, is this a need to center indigenous led climate change responses and water protection strategies, um, which, you know, as I've kind of shown through my work, I need to be rooted in the revitalization of indigenous governance systems, um, as well as knowledge systems, um, which are fundamental to increasing the resilience of, of communities and um, their ability to, to adapt. Um, and these communities as ultimately uh, 
significant actors in, in Arctic water governance systems. Um, so again, as I mentioned, um, there's many, um, uh, there's a lot of diversity within the Arctic and most of my research has concentrated in Yukon, although um, I've actually done some research on water and water governance in Alaska as well. So while I continue to um, plan to work in those contexts, I'm really interested in um, scaling up this research a bit to um, look at some of these other jurisdictions and, and what's happening there in terms of developing adaptive and resilient uh, forms of water governance, um, as well as um, how these climate ju uh, climate justice lens can can help us uh, think about how to improve those approaches. Um, so with that, uh, I'll say thank you, um, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Super, thank you for that, Dr. Wilson. I was really, I mean, it, it, the entire presentation was amazing. The, the one thing that really stood out for me is that very powerful quote that you shared with the elder about the importance and the power of water. What, um, I haven't thought of it like that before. So I'm glad that you share that. That is just showing the, the importance of water. Uh, so some questions have come in. I'm going to go to YouTube first before I go to Slido, if that's all right. So Teddy, if you're able to post this first question, uh, which is some scientists name this as global warming, not as climate change. Their argument is that climate change is a natural process and global warming is a human made program. Mm -hmm. What is your view? Hmm. I mean, I think we are generally seeing warming trends, but um, also there are some places where like things might be getting colder, um, you know, uh, not on a permanent basis necessarily. But um, yeah, I don't necessarily come down on either side, but I definitely have heard people talk about the differences between those those two a lot. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question from YouTube is about this 1.5 degree world. And actually, one of your colleagues a few weeks ago was talking a lot about this, uh, about the 1.5. So Canada has a goal of 1.5 degrees. The Arctic uh, is experiences much faster increases in climate warming. Has the federal government um, a proportioned greater financial resources to accommodate this disparity? Hmm, now you're testing me on recent budget <laughs> announcements. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I actually can't give you exact exact figures, but I, I would say that uh, greater resources um, should be um, should be put towards both climate change adaptation and mitigation in Canada um, more than more than have been. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But uh, Tim, I need to, you know, go back and read the news from last week and see what the announcements were. Um, so thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. And and along those lines, I was thinking as you're showing all those examples of all the different strategies, and I'm so glad to see there are so many strategies, is I was what kept going through my head was what is the coordination or collaboration between all the strategies, right? I mean, do they work together in tandem or do some have different goals? Of, of course, there'd be some different time lengths to them. And also, how are they measuring success? Um, and what that means. I don't, I know, I know you're not a public policy consultant, but I don't know. If, I mean, you've done research on that too, uh, uh, as part of your, as part of your work. I don't know if you can comment on, on that at all, but the collaboration yeah. between various different strategies yeah. that we're seeing. Well, I mean, I think, um, I, I think there, I mean, there is a coordination across Canada, the federal policy, there's aspects of it that all provincial and territorial governments need to follow, but provincial and territorial governments, um, it kind of, yeah, relates to the kind of constitutional division of authorities and, um, and yeah, each province and territory can develop their, their own strategy, but there are things like what's kind of termed like the federal carbon tax that mm -hmm. actually um, to a certain extent, everybody needs to follow. And there have been uh, Supreme recent uh, Supreme court cases about that where, um, I think three main provinces, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario, uh, were um, uh, proposing approaches that were um, uh, not in line with um, federal carbon pricing. So um, essentially, they um, you can any province or territory can develop their own. It just has to be at the same standard or or higher. Um, and so. Um, if you don't propose one that kind of meets the federal standard, then you you fall uh, like Manitoba does at this point mm -hmm. using this thing called the federal backstop. Um, so there are relationships between between these plans, um, and a lot of coordination is needed. But there's also 
some differences in terms of uh, di different t uh, different governments have different perspectives on on what should should happen, and you can see that across across Canada. So. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. You know, thanks for weighing in on that. Um, another question from YouTube, uh, Teddy, the third one there, if you wanted to post up, is uh, what are your thoughts on academia as an institution and publishing Indigenous scholars, especially when it comes to research on climate, land and water? Mm -hmm. ah, this is a topic of a whole other talk, but I think um, academia has a I'll just start by saying has a long colonial history. And um, as a scholar of settler origin, a non-Indigenous person, I need to be very, I am very aware of that and I um, need to think about that in my work. Um, I think that we are seeing shifts in academia um, towards um, hiring and privileging more Indigenous scholarship, that is scholarship uh, done by uh, Indigenous peoples. And we are also seeing um, shifts in terms of how research on Indigenous topics is allowed to continue, whether or not you're Indigenous, in terms of needing to partner with Indigenous um, communities or our rights holder organizations um, and to have explicit agreements about um, both having consent to do that research and how it benefits those communities. Um, but I, I also see, you know, um, limits in terms of like what that can do. <laughs> you know, research is important. Um, indigenous scholarship is really important, um, but a lot of the really important work in terms of climate, land and water happens out there uh, with practitioners um, and activists and uh, people like that. So um, I think those two groups can work together and sometimes they, they actually have overlap um, in terms of um, activists being professors, um, but I think there are limitations. So thanks for that question, Erin. Um, very thought provoking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and as you were saying, it made me think about, um, uh, you know, one of your colleagues in the Faculty of Science, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Meryl Ballard, who is a leading Indigenous scholar, yes. who's doing significant work on, uh, particularly on water and in the community in which she she's from. And I'm sorry, I forget the name of the community, but they've had a lot of boil advisory well issues for, for years. So um, mm -hmm. for those who are listening, there are a number of Indigenous scholars who are, uh, who are working in this mm -hmm. area uh, with, with Dr. Wilson. So yeah. I think Lake uh, St. Martin First Nation, I could be wrong. That though. sounds right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that sounds yeah. right. So wonderful work. Yes, I also encourage you to check Merle's uh, work out. So mm -hmm. thanks for mm -hmm. that reminder. <laughs> um, I think I skipped over the preceding question. <laughs> Pardon me on YouTube. I'm just trying to see here. Um, Oh, and I think maybe you've already answered this, Dr. Wilson, but it's in your experience, do you find there's a discrepancy between how settlers examine these issues versus Indigenous people, particularly in academia? So it's by the same person who asked the previous question. So I, I'm yeah. sorry I asked them in the wrong order. That's okay. Um, yes, I, I mean, I do. I think it, um, I think that, uh, I think Indigenous peoples are, are best positioned to do this type of scholarship. Um, and again, their work uh, uh, within academia needs to be centered, um, for example, the work of, of Merle. Um, but I think that one of the, I think there will always be differences. For example, I'm a person, a, a non-Indigenous person. There's things that I can literally never understand in my whole life experience. Um, but at the same time, I think um, settler scholars, um, we need to shift, we need to learn. And some of the key differences um, are, are things that people can can do a lot of unlearning related to in terms of um, the types of scholarship that really reinforce like colonial relationships in often like people aren't doing it intentionally, but it's just so, so ingrained in, in this type of research. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I would just challenge kind of non-Indigenous or settler scholars to to really think about that and and reflect on how they may be, you know, um, reinforcing colonial relationships through their work, um, whether they explicitly work with Indigenous peoples or not. Um, so uh, hopefully that answers your question, although it's, it was another big one. <laughs> so. I, I like the term you learned, unlearning. I think that's really, a, that's a powerful way of describing it in terms of unlearning what we've already, what we've learned before perhaps is not the right way. So so thank you for that. Um, Teddy, we're going to go to Slido now. There's uh, two questions there that I wanted to, that I wanted to bring up. 
So first one is governments are the mechanism by which a society takes collective action. How would all the differing worldviews be merged to make timely decisions? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a big question. So um, I guess when I think about this, so, so often people talk about the differences, for example, in, in between worldviews, and they talk about it often in differences between, say, indigenous um, knowledge systems and science. Um, and when I think about the implications for governance, though, uh, I want to make really clear that Indigenous peoples have their own governance systems. And so I think we need to start with that assumption rather than um, thinking about how there's, you know, some decision making process out there. And we need to feed both of these knowledge systems into that. I think it's about um, having equal say in decision making and developing processes that acknowledge that. Um, and acknowledge Indigenous rights, authority, and jurisdiction, and that naturally from acknowledging jurisdiction and authority, um, Indigenous uh, relationships to water, what you call worldviews, will be better represented. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. But there's people talking about, you know, different processes and how to do this. There's actually a report, I'm going to forget the full name of the institution, CG, uh, Canadian Indigenous Governance Institute, maybe, but there's a two reports, I think, from 2018 or 2019 on braiding um, Indigenous law, um, Canadian law, and international law. Um, so you might be interested in some of the chapters in those reports. Um, so leading Indigenous legal scholars who could tell you much more <laughs> in much more detail about um, potential ways to do this. Okay, thank you for that. Um, next question that came up on Slido is, has any of your work intersected with Dr. Ashley Consolo's work in the Arctic in Newfoundland and Labrador? I'm aware of Ashley's work, but I've actually never worked with her. Um, so, you know, I've read some of her papers, um, but mm -hmm. to date, I haven't had the, the privilege of working with her. Although, um, uh, you know, many, a, a number of people that I, I know have, have worked with her uh, and know her in a way, but uh, yeah. That is uh, ahead in my career, I hope, <laughs> to get to know <laughs> Ashley's work. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so as we wait for some more questions to come through, so again, everybody, go either to Slido or YouTube. It's really up to you which platform you would like to use. We use both. But I wanted to also, I wrote down here in my notes here, report. You had specifically mentioned in your presentation, uh, you had recommended a report for us to review. Can you remind viewers again uh, what that report is? Yes. <clears throat> Let me just get the title for you. So it is a, it's called Lessons Learned on uh, from Canada's Record on Climate Change. And let me see if I just have a link that I can share. Maybe not. Yeah, so it's, uh, if you Google uh, Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development 2021, um, lessons learned from Canada's record on climate change, you'll find this report and it reviews kind of, yeah, Canada's record on what policies have been set and, um, and, uh, the extent to which we have, um, I should say achieved, but actually not achieved many of those goals. So, uh, as well as some recommendations for, um, how we can, can move forward. And actually some of the things that, um, the federal government, for example, is doing to um, increase accountability uh, in terms of and in order to live up to those commitments. OK, great. OK, maybe we will put that link in when we do a follow up email to everybody with the the, uh, the copy of this recording, as well as a survey, just so if people wanted to take a peek out of that sounds like a really great read for anybody who's who's interested in uh, in your line of research. Um, so. Um, I'm just when I refer to Teddy, I'm referring to everybody. He's he's uh, on the back end of IST. I I don't know if there's any other questions that have come through on YouTube. I'm sort of trying to figure this out here. Um, I think I don't think I've missed anything. I think that's it. And I'm looking to Slido. No, I'll, I'll put one last call out there for everybody. But I also, uh, so Teddy's saying there isn't anything on YouTube right now. Um, so I, I just wanted to uh, refresh our, our viewers that you were talking about future research. And if you could just share a little bit more about, you know, if we were to to call upon you in a year or two from now, uh, what would your next topic be to, to share with us uh, on, on the amazing things that you're doing right now in research? Mm -hmm. So 
I mean, in terms of the future research, I um, I think I mentioned related to this topic, I, I do want to think about scaling up a bit. And I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned by comparing across Arctic jurisdictions. Um, so even in the Canadian Arctic, you could look at, you know, what's going on in Yukon and what's going on in Northwest Territories and, and um, Nunavut in terms of water law, water strategies, and how they intersect with climate change. Um, and um, yeah, it would be ideal to, you know, be able to um, partner with uh, Indigenous communities in some of those jurisdictions as well. Um, but that that has, that's not happening quite yet. But I think um, there are, you know, there are also water scholars in other Arctic jurisdictions who would be interested to kind of compare what's going on, um, what's going on there. So um, in a dream world, I'd also be able to look at Europe and all this stuff, but I don't know. I think uh, the Canadian jurisdictions, it would be super interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you raise a great point on, on all of that. That would be really interesting to, to, to see the comparisons between all the various jurisdictions. So I hope you're able to, to achieve that and, and to, uh, to conduct that research. And, and thank you very much for, for this really interesting presentation and making us all think about uh, more about how, what, perhaps even what we can be doing or how, what we can be learning to, to make more of a difference in uh, trying to achieve that, that 1.5 degree world. Oh, um, okay. So uh, said Dr. Wilson recommends you search Google for lessons learned from Canada's record on climate change. So uh, I, I encourage all of you to, to find that on Google and to give it a read. I think it's a, a lot of great information that we can, uh, that we can all learn. So, uh, so with that, if there, there are no more questions um, to, to thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. Excellent presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're very busy as a Canada Research Chair. Uh, to all of our viewers, as you know, we send you a follow-up email that has a link to this uh, this this YouTube uh, presentation as well as a survey. Uh, we will also add that link in there if uh, on Google on that report that Dr. Wilson has cited. Um, also, um, just to, to let you know, if you haven't registered for next week's pre uh, presentation, I highly encourage you to, to do that. So as part of our climate series, next week we welcome Dr. Lisa Lissetto. She is also assistant professor in the Center for Earth Observation Science and Department of Environment and Geography. And she will be presenting on what can beluga whales teach us about climate change, ecosystems and human relations. I know I'm really excited and interesting to hear learn more about beluga whales. Uh, so as I said, if you haven't registered, please do that as soon as you can. You won't want to miss that presentation. Thank you for participating today. Please check out our other sessions that we've hosted in 2020 and 2021 um, on our Virtual Learning for Life program website. Register for next week's session, as I mentioned, and we will see you next week. Thanks very much, everyone.